Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so very much for coming today. I'm Paul Sutton and I'm very grateful to be able to share this day with such a distinguished and incredible group of people who are here to honor the humanity and life and work of our remarkable friend, Ron Schlicker. You've been listening to a little bit of his favorite music and now we're seeing some pictures of, of what was so important to Ron, the incredible array of humanity that he gathered around him and supported and loved. And to have you here and return that support and love is the most tremendous honor I think we could accord him. <laughs> Perfect timing, thanks for <laughs> It's, it's truly amazing, but not at all surprising to see all of you here. I mean, it already feels like sort of an extended family reunion, and, and this is something that's wholly appropriate for a man whose warm heart made you feel like family if you knew him even for a blink of an eye. Ron was so proud and full of love and talked so very much about his family in Tennessee that those of us in his very large work family sometimes felt like they could be honorary schlickers. <laughs> and we are very honored today to be joined by some members of his Tennessee family, Ron's sister, Debbie Rankin, and her husband, Arthur, and his brother, Mike, the woman of hair, <laughs> and Darlene Schlicker. Those of us in this remarkable work family represented today look forward to sharing with you a bit about why Ron is held in such incredibly high esteem as a professional and person in Washington and really all over the world. Many of you know that Ron had a special spirituality and an uncanny ability to connect with people on that level. I'm certain he is especially pleased that we are gathered to honor him on All Saints Day which is also appropriate in every way. With this in mind, I would like to ask all of us to share a moment of silence and appreciation of his deep and beautiful soul. Thank you very much. I would now like to introduce Mr. Hassan Abbasi, who will share a reading, or a couple of readings in Ron's memory in Arabic, one of his life's great passions, and a language that he mastered through both his love and his incredible natural gifts, rather than through formal instruction. So, Hassan Abbasi. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to start by saying Zayek uh, Yevesha. Uh, as Paul would always, uh, as, uh, as he would always tell me, Ron, um, as soon as I saw him, um, I never met an Arabist quite like Ron Schlecker. As you all know, uh, an amazing soul exceptional person. And I have uh, two readings I'd like to read um, in his honor. One is uh, focused on nature, and it's an Arabic poet who is anonymous, as I was, I was looking for something to read in his honor. And I thought this was really touching, as he's so spiritual, and it's all in, uh, about nature. والأكهوان والأكهان يفتح وأهل الدنيا تزهر هدت أن سوسان وأندى جمال وألا ورد لا تنسى وأندى تيان وجلس أن نرجس على السمال وجف أني لا يسمع هذا ينور The earth spreads out of the green carpet the daisies open up and the world blossoms. Speak of the white lily and praise its beauty and forget not the magnificence of the rose. 
and placed the narcissus on the left and mentioned not the jasmine until it blooms. The second poem that I chose is from a, uh, a poet from the 800 Common Era, Al Abbas ibn al Ahnaf. Khallan minnak tarfi wa imtalan minnak khatir ka innak min aini na'alt ala albi. You departed my sight and entered my thoughts, traveled from my eyes into my heart. We will always love you, Marsha. Thank you, Hassan, for honoring Ron and letting us hear the beauty, depth, and sonorousness of, of meaning that Ron loves so much about Arabic. We will now take the time and turn to, to you to offer remembrances and memories of Ron. Um, I've been asked to start with some messages from people who were very dear friends of Ron and who unfortunately have been unable to join us today. Uh, Tom Miller and Ambassador George Kroll, as well as a message from uh, the Foreign Service National Staff of Embassy Beirut. So I will you know, read those, those messages for you. Then I will ask uh, Mr. Gary Piercy, another very, very close friend, to start off. And then what we will do is we'll have some microphones for either side of this kind of unusual room. And, We'll bring them to you and give people the chance to share their memories and thoughts. Um, this message is from Tom Miller. Ron was larger than life, which is why it's so difficult for me to imagine he's gone. His generous spirit, kindness, fierce intelligence, and thick sense filled Embassy Cyprus and spurred us to our best efforts. One day, I had just finished a very serious discussion with one of my employees, and the phone rang. And sure enough, it was Ambassador Schlicker on the other end, saying, what's with you and Athos? <laughs> he asked. I was tempted to check to see if my office was bugged. <laughs> but we all know that this incredible spirit was not limited by space or time. Ron was a remarkable listener with a talent for discerning deeper truths. After a reception we both attended one night, I was happy to have made few acquaintances. Ron, on the other hand, not only knew the names of every participant, but had learned who was dating whom and what their views were on pretty much every subject on earth. <laughs> we all held him in the hall. In spite of his success at the highest levels of the State Department, he always had time for friends and put his family first. That's so true. I'm a better person for having met him and feel his presence almost every day. This is a message from uh, Ambassador uh, George Kroll. I deeply regret I personally cannot be with you all today to honor our dear friend and colleague Ron Schlicker. Ron and I first met when we entered the Foreign Service in January 1982. As we prepared for our first assignments as members of the Fighting Eighth, a100 class of officers. We became close friends. Starting from that time, we called each other Kingston and Clifton. For Kingston, Tennessee, where Ron came from, and lovely Clifton, New Jersey, where I grew up. This was a practice we continued throughout our life. Ron's sense of humor, his erudite brilliance, his unflinching frankness, and his endearing southernness ruled what he did, despite careers taking us to different regions of the world and never serving directly together, we managed to keep in touch and occasionally see each other to chew the fat, have a drink, talk and laugh about the past and present, and admire all the many pretty things, as he called them, that he collected from his job and travels. I only regret that I had never got to visit Ron in his beloved Tennessee, although we were planning to get together soon after I retired from the Foreign Service. Ron's voice, his laugh, his warmth, his fabulous facility in Arabic, his hilarious ability to mimic, his spot on analyses and descriptions of people and places will never ever leave me, as I am sure they will never leave many of you here today. Ron, uh, excuse me, uh, 
Ron's passing from this life is a great loss to all of us, but the effect he's had, his family, me, you, the foreign service in our country is immense, indelible, and will last many years, certainly to the end of my life. Ron, you are among the best people I've ever known. Being your friend and colleague is a privilege I cherish. You were physically brave as demonstrated in Iraq. You were a superb leader as exhibited in affecting the evacuation of Americans from Lebanon to Cyprus. But most of all, you always spoke truth to power regardless of the consequences to yourself. Thank you, my dear Kingston, for a life well lived and for being you. Like so many others here today, I miss you terribly, but your memory will always be with me, will comfort me like it does everyone you've ever known, your dear Clifton. Finally, a message from Mr. Abdullah Basbus on behalf of the Foreign Service National Staff of Embassy Beirut. Since I could not be there today to gather about Ron and his refined style, the Lebanese wine and the French fondue he liked, the smart tricky jokes, the shisha hubbly bubbly he enjoyed while watching the sunset from his apartment at the embassy, and most of all for listening to the voice of Maria Callas for relaxation. I wish I could be there for, to share with his family and friends my unforgettable memories I've enjoyed with him. We in Beirut would very much appreciate if you could extend our deepest sympathy on behalf of his friends here in Lebanon and myself. If you've heard Maria Callas, think of Ron's memory. One more time, I want to thank you all so much for your concern and your love for Ron. May God bless and protect all of you and your beloved ones. So I would like to ask at this time Mr. Gary Piercy to come offer his thoughts. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Gary Piercy. Ron and I were friends for over 20 years. I first met Ron in my neighborhood hookah cafe, which we call Shisha, Mila, there's many names for it, Hubbly Bubbly, uh, in 1996. I noticed him sitting and talking with a young lady whom he introduced me as his friend Susan Etheridge. They were so hospitable that even though I was a complete stranger, first time in this cafe, they immediately invited me to join in on their conversation. This initial um, modest encounter led to many years worth of friendship with both Ron and Susan. We spent countless hours laughing, hanging out. I'm sure a lot of people's room have done the same. Smoking hookah, telling jokes, talking about political and current events, dinner, all the above. Very quickly, I learned what a great person Ron was and the genuine kindness and respect he had for all persons of all walks of life. Over time, my frequent encounters with Ron further reveals his social and political acuity along with the strong values he placed on family and friends, very similar to my own. Ron was also, as we've heard, spiritually gifted and drew in various types of people through stimulating discussions of his spiritual encounters. Ron was no ordinary friend. He invested time, care, and love into all of his friends. He made all of us feel warm, engaged, and welcome. Who would ever thought this six-year-old sitting on his grandma's porch swing, listening to all those foreign shortwave broadcasts, dreaming about learning foreign languages and travel, would ever meet someone as special as Ron Schlicker? Ron invited me to visit him while he was serving as the ambassador at the U.S. Embassy in Nicosia, Cyprus. He also challenged me to expand my linguistic capabilities, because we spoke French all the time, I speak French, um, by studying Arabic. Not only did he make the suggestion, but he tutored me in his limited free time outside his strenuous job with my homework that contributed significantly to my receiving an A in the class. <laughs> in closing, I'm forever fortunate and blessed to have had a friend like Ron in my life meeting many of his wonderful friends, family, and colleagues helped me to truly understand the man who has left us during his short time on earth. Ron, may you rest in peace as we will all meet again at another place and time. 
My thoughts and prayers are with all of Ron's friends, family, and colleagues as we heal from this unexpected loss of this fine gentleman. God bless you all. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to, to turn to you to offer your thoughts and memories. Please just raise your hand and we'll get right to you. We have a microphone. Oh, okay. oh, right back here. It's on. Go ahead. And if I could ask that you please uh, say your name. Mm -hmm. I'm Ann Robach. My husband is Bill Robach. He couldn't be here today. He's in Syria and he asked me to share this with you. I love Rome. He was a mentor and a friend. He looked after me, appreciated my skills and talents. Although they were a humble blend in comparison with his brilliance, he nurtured, my, he nurtured my skills and looked for ways in any way that I could be useful, test myself, and rise in the service. He always conveyed that I was part of the team, a valued member who could contribute. He was scarily talented himself. He strode he strode well above most of his peers in the service. But he was in essence a humble person, given his extraordinary intellect. His default position, which I felt so many times when I was with him, was, we, you and me, us, we're all in this thing together. What do you think? For a relatively junior officer at the time, it was an extremely empowering and welcoming attitude. He was loving and welcoming to my family, my wife, that would be me, <laughs> and I partied hard with Henry and Jeff Feldman and others in that band of officers and friends in Jerusalem and Washington. He was a great storyteller, a talented mimic, and could regale his table mates over red wine or something stronger with tales of intricate high diplomacy, for an appetizer, of course, before he got into the good stuff. The jokes, the gossip, the low-minded or hypocritical behavior of some overly esteemed figure. <laughs> and he loved to be amused himself, <laughs> appreciating a good story or remark. His eyes sparkled and he would burst into a high-pitched cackle that magnified the humor and the power of the shared moment. Ron saw ghosts, too. He had a spooky, extrasensory perception, or esp side to him, and claimed it gave him a power to sense things that most folks didn't have. He swore the Consul General's residence in Jerusalem was haunted. And in his description of the place, you were suitably creeped out in a almost believe him. Before you asked him to wag his finger and do his Arafat imitation to change the subject. I hope he is using those special gifts from the other side today to see us gathered, me, Bill from faraway Syria, with you all in spirit, he would like that. <coughs> gathered to laugh, to mourn, to celebrate a kindred spirit, a treasured friend, a guide of foreign service is not likely to see the lights of again. Someone else like to help out. Please. Thank you, Gary. Uh, my name is Carol Keelan. I was Ron's deputy, one of Ron's deputies. Uh, in 1999, when he was in charge of what was then called the Office of Egyptian and North African Affairs, uh, I succeeded. Liz Dibble, husband Philo Dibble in that job, and several others. I was an economist, and Ron had an incredible political sense. So it was suitable for him to be the lead, and me to be a supporting actress, if you will. And that's what we did. Um, I want to just talk about one crisis that Ron managed that taught me a lot. You may remember the crash of Egypt here in 990. It prefigured 9-11 in the eyes of many animals. And it happened on our watch. 
So Ron put me in charge, since I was his supporting actress, of the task force. We had about a dozen officers on our desk, including some who have gone on to be ambassadors, uh, as well as deputy chiefs of mission, spokespeople, academics, and so on. But what Ron did was try to interpret, not just for the State Department, but for the entire United States, for the military, for the intelligence community, the, the expression that we kept hearing on that black box, Allahu Akbar. What did it mean? Was it a claim of political Islam? Or did it just mean, oh my god, we're about to crash? Well, Ron listened, and he put all his officers, who were also Arabists, budding Arabists maybe, young people, he put them into that room, and they listened to that tape too. Now, we may never know what the answer is, because ultimately we just agreed to disagree with the Egyptians about this. But that was Ron's great subtlety and his great gift that we still had a relationship, an important relationship with Egypt and with the rest of the Middle East, even today. Thank you. Well, my name is Jessica Steinheis Matthews. Ron knew me first as Jessica Steinheis. I met him in 10th grade. Um, which means I probably don't know most of you here. And I must tell you, from having attended the services in Tennessee, I had no idea what a treasure I had lost. Because true to his uh, modesty and humility, every time he saw me, his exploits were about the last thing he wanted to talk to, talk about. He wanted to talk to me, how everybody was doing, how things were going. And I heard vaguely where he was at any given time. Um, I have three tiny things. He shared with me the love of pizza. Um, we went to a Godfather's Pizza once, got a big, deep, big dish, deep dish to share with a couple of other of our friends. and. Um, I noticed that I was the only one there who was not using a knife and fork. And Ron said, Jess, that's because you're the only one here with no facial hair. <laughs> Everybody had beards and mustaches, and uh, I, it never occurred to me. Um, one of the earliest memories I have of Ron was New Year's Eve 1975 going into 1976. Darlene, now Schlicker, Walker's family had a New Year's Eve party that we were all invited to. And Mike and Ron and I were in the kitchen watching intently as the first microwave oven <laughs> we had ever seen was bubbling the pizza and heating it. But that year, we also both looked at each other and said, this is going to be a big year in both of our lives. And we both knew it, and we were very scared of it, but it was a big year, and we got through it, and there we just went on. But I will tell you, Ron was always one of those friends who knew me much better than I knew him. And when one very deep, lifelong friend of mine passed away. I called him in, I think he was 1990, so I think it was Lebanon. And I called and said, hey Ron, I guess you're wondering why I'm calling. And he said, I presume it's about Melinda. And I said, what? Melinda Dillon, what? Another of our friends had died the same day. And I said, no, I'm calling about Bob. And he said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. He was somebody that I could call when I was at the end of my rope because a friend of mine had died. And 
As I say, I did not have any idea what kind of a treasure we've lost. I'm very grateful to see the shine and the sparkle now. But uh, he was always just wrong. Thank you. We have somebody right here. Hi, my name is Dale Shursago. Um, it's an honor to be here among so many of you diplomats. And I knew Ron from a different perspective. Uh, some of you may remember me from Baghdad. And uh, I was his military assistant uh, when he showed up in December 2003, worked in the Office of Provincial Outreach. And I know his, I will talk to his uh, brother and sister, he probably did pass on this story, but I just wanted to explain one story that I don't think a lot of people really knew because we went out into Baghdad one day and what was to be a small group of maybe 30 people to try and bring them into the political process in Iraq as in, in the early days of the government. Ron, as he was uh, preparing for the, for the speech, taking his notes, and I was looking at his notes and never have I ever seen anybody prepare notes in Arabic. And we go downtown, and it's not 30 people, it's 300 people in a room. And if you can imagine the uh, tension in the city at the time, and not expecting to have 300 people in the room at the time, the security detail with us was a little concerned, needless to say. <laughs> um, and it, it, it was utter chaos when everything started, and Ron got up to speak because he was representing the uh, Coalition Provisional Authority. And when he started speaking, his Arabic was so elegant, as, as some of the other uh, Iraqis used to tell me, they said he had an elegant form of Arabic. And I'm not real familiar with it, but he made that crowd just come to a stop. Everything was quiet. They all listened to him. And then a couple of minutes later, all of a sudden, somebody starts getting up and yelling, and I'm starting to get concerned. I'm scanning the area, looking at the rest of the security detail, and they're getting ready. Ron sitting up there, just cool and calm. Not a worry on his face. And his speech that day energized that group into a, a form of nationalism I have not seen in a long time. He got them excited, he got them involved, and they got them into the political process. Many people, we were the only Americans in there, so I, I don't know if that story ever got out to a lot of the other different within CPA, but that was quite, quite the event to be at. Ron, from a military perspective, all the military folks that worked with Ron in Baghdad respected him. They thought he was the greatest diplomat ever. A great friend. We had uh, many uh, dinners afterwards after we came back. And uh, my family and all my colleagues in the military will miss him. Okay, to burn this side. Yeah, hi, I'm Bob Silverman. I, like many of us, have uh, had the great good fortune of serving with Ron. So I have two short stories about him. I think Bill Rolbeck mentioned he uh, cultivated this ESP sense, right? And I remember him coming to Cairo, uh, where he had served earlier and had won, by the way, the Director General's Reporting Award there. And he uh, knew all the FSNs, they had all worked for him. And they were all convinced that he knew exactly what was on their mind at all times. <laughs> <laughs> and he would cultivate this, right? And so he would say, what about X? He said, how did you know I was thinking about X? Oh my Lord, and so, anyway, Ron, uh, he, I think, believed this, like I think Bill said, and uh, it, it, it worked. I saw it in practice. My other brief story is that, uh, again, it's about Iraq, when uh, the fall of uh, 2003, he and I deployed out there under the CPA. And he was head of this uh, provisional authority, and I was in Tikrit. We didn't get many visitors in Tikrit, <laughs> and uh, for good reason. But my the first visitor, when we formed our mission out there was Ron Schlicker, and uh, someone else had talked about also his great personal courage and bravery, and uh, so they wanted to remember that. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Tom Warwick, and I, I want to say um, for Debbie and Mike especially, uh, you, you I think probably appreciate that this is one of the most extraordinary 
turnouts in, in American diplomatic history. I mean, the amount of, of experience in this room and the amount of love for Ron in all that he did uh, for many of us, myself included, personally and professionally, is, is just absolutely extraordinary. And, and I hope that in some way we have given back to you in the way that, that you through Ron have, have given to us. Um, I worked with Ron both in Baghdad and in Washington. I was part of the same group as Colonel Shirasago, who spoke just a minute ago. Um, and there, I, I've seen in several pictures, a couple of which I've seen. There's one that I saw, there's one that I didn't see that was actually one of the most striking to me. I got to take a picture of his office when he wasn't there. And um, so it looks like you know an empty desk like so many others, but it was, it was quite striking. And the story that goes with it um, when I was told by Ambassador Jones, uh, uh, go report to Ron Schlicker in the Office of Provincial Outreach, he could use some help, uh, do whatever you can to help him. Uh, and so I make my way to his office, and it was sort of through this warren uh, of rooms. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, it was through this sort of warren of rooms. And uh, in working for Ron, uh, as Gail and I did for uh, several months, one of the, the things that really struck me was Ron has, has seized upon some of the most strategic real estate in all of Iraq. Because that office was located right next to uh, uh, the bathroom that the Jerry Bremer, the ruler of Iraq, had to use. And so Ron got more face time with the Ambassador Bremer than uh, someone else. Uh, and it helped a lot. Um, then uh, the other thing which, which no one here will use. Um, are Ron's inimitable expressions and things, all of which were quoting famous people, some of his photographs we've seen. Um, and, and I almost wish we could hear uh, some of those recitations again, but certain expressions which I won't even pretend to use are, are so memorable to, uh, to people here. Um, Ron won a dissent award without ever having, as far as I know, filed the dissent cable. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and you really have to appreciate how extraordinary that was. <laughs> since, since that's what the award was for, and he never did it, and he won it, and everybody knew, and this is what's important about that, everyone knew the integrity that he had. And so he could make his views known even when they were unpopular, as, as was said earlier. He knew how to speak truth to power. And he knew how to do it in a way that was, was as far as I know, just absolutely uh, without equal. Um, and then there's one other photograph that I wish was in there, um, because he promised us when he left Iraq um, that he would have the biggest grin on his face that anyone has ever seen. And uh, sure enough, after we got back and after we were working in the office uh, for quite some time, he pulled it out. Uh, and showed it to us, and sure enough, it was in fact the biggest grin we've ever seen. So wherever Ron is, I hope his spirit is grinning in the same way. And I did want to just say thank you to his family for all that he did for me and for everybody else here in this room. Hi, my name is Connie Mayer. I'm on the phones and many friends from the department. I met him first back in 1991 at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. And I think we met the day before the air war started <laughs> in the Iraqi Iran war. Many, many glorious moments like all the other colleagues here with Ron over the years um, in between. But there's one vignette that I'll try to share and get it right because it kind of weds the NEA and the State Department side of the house in Tennessee. So it was one evening, probably at a shisha bar, and he had done something that day in a series of meetings that demonstrated his brilliance as a veteran NEA hand and a little pressing diplomat. So I complimented him, and I said, you know, Ron, you really are pretty, I won't say, but it was probably like hot next <laughs> I said, you're really cool. I've learned a lot from you, and I enjoy our friendship. And he's like, kind I always had a leg up on being a brilliant NEA hand because I'm from the South. <laughs> and I said, how's that work, Ron? And he said, look, I kind of think about it. You're an analyst. I'm from the analytic side of the State Department, not the diplomatic side. Just think about it. The Middle East and the South have a lot in common. The politicians are corrupt. There's way too many religious figures that use religion for their own purposes. 
and in the South and in the Middle East, family is everything, and family always has to pretend that everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we know everything's not okay, because now you're without one, but I want to echo Tom's comments uh, and, and Paul's. It's really amazing how much this man put Tennessee on all of our maps. <laughs> And uh, the love and joy he had for you, for somebody that was deployed overseas and not able to get home as often as he might have liked, we're really, really glad, not that he retired, but that he did retire in time to spend some years with you all because his demise was quite on time, but we are happy that he got that time to do. Any other people who would like to offer thoughts or Yes, please. Yep, make us happy. Thank you, honey. <laughs> so my name is John Zimmerman. My wife is Jane, and she was Ron's DCM. And he would know all FSOs and interact with them. But he also had to interact with the spouses. And that can be difficult sometimes. Because FSO generally have very uh, big intellects, hard to talk to them. Uh, Ron always took time. The one thing that I knew a little bit more of uh, was politics, and so we talked a lot about Tennessee politics, so I'm always grateful he brought me into his uh, embassy family. Any other thoughts? Or we have some time, please, if there's... If, if not, if there are no other remarks, then... I'll just add one more. <laughs> So, yes, I was Ron's DCM in Cyprus, and of course, as you know, Ron did not marry, but uh, that was something very hard for the Cypriots to wrap their heads around, so I was frequently called Mrs. Schlicker. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, my husband didn't mind. I think we, we agreed it was an honorific, but I always wondered because many of you may have been at Ron's Swear again before he went to Cyprus. And the eighth floor, as I understand, as I'm sitting in the front office in Nicosia, but everyone's told me how beautiful it was when Ron wrote me this beautiful message about how gorgeous eighth floor looked. It was all decorated for the holidays. People had turned out in droves. The weather was terrible. They all knew they were going to have a nightmarish commute home, but they came for a swearing in. And so thanks to everyone who was there. Then we received a wheels down in Cyprus. And his first morning was Christmas Eve. And he opened up the residence and had all the mission and the family members over to his house for Christmas Eve. And it was, I think, oh, I get tingles on my spine now. I just remember what a beautiful holiday it was, the sense of opportunity, the fact that he knew not only all the officers and people from all the different agencies and the spouses, the children, and above all, our beloved foreign service national colleagues with whom America could not function abroad. Um, and then the last little story was late on that night, he came and had Christmas to eat dinner in our house, and I had one of those big giant official residences with the giant Terra staircase. And so my son had been sick, and he hadn't been at the party at Ron's house earlier. But he hears someone at the door, and he comes out, and our eyes lock. And Ron stands there at the bottom of the stairs as my little five-year-old son comes walking down, and our eyes are locked. And he walks straight up to Ron, again, never breaking eye contact. And he puts out his arms, and Ron just scoops him up in this one giant motion. And as you all know, Ron didn't have children, but in a way, we were all his children. And he made so much space in his heart for kids, especially his nieces, his nephews. In fact, one of the great things about being in Chattanooga was seeing pictures of ones I saw as babies, and now are you know young adolescents or adults. So I just want to say, you know. Um, the Foreign Service, as you can tell here, and the State Department, because we have more than Foreign Service officers here, we have to run that. Anyway, we're all now your family. You're part of our family. We've always felt part of yours. Thank you, Mr. Schlicker. <laughs> I'd like to, unless there are other remarks, remote place. Hi, I'm uh, Nabil Khoury, and um, I just want to say that uh, Ron is uh, one of only two people whom I met my very first assignment, practically my very first few months in the Foreign Service.
Ephesus. We were in Alexandria, Egypt. And um, one of only two people who remained true friends to the very end. We went in different directions, served in different places. But he always stayed in touch. And I wish I brought some of my photographs, uh, particularly in Alexandria, at some of these uh, fun evenings and parties, uh, many at my house. My son, Gibran, was only six months old then. And I have one picture I'm very fond of, with Ron carrying my son. He would come to my house. I was a cultural attaché there, so I always had receptions and dinners. No matter whether it was a big reception or a sit-down dinner, he would find Gibran and he would carry him and walk around with him half the evening. <laughs> he loved that boy and, and my boy loved him. Uh, so I started calling him Almo, which means uncle uh, in Arabic. And he called me Almo uh, to the very end, uh, before he retired meetings at NEA. He called me out in a crowded room and say, Ammo, what do you think? <laughs> um, it's just, it's just a, a lovely man. And I'm sure it's hard for all of us in this room to talk about him. But I think he'd probably be saying, why all the grim faces? Look at them. Put some music, get the alcohol going. Get the <laughs> Now I would just like to, to close our remembrances with a few words of my own. I had the great fortune of working with Ron over the years, both at State and in his second life after leaving the department as a sought after and highly respected analyst and advisor on the Middle East with Sandy Charles, who's here, and the team at CNO Resources. Like everything Ron did, and everywhere he worked, his wisdom and warmth and insight, brilliance, and astoundingly deep and empathetic understanding of the region, its peoples, and its cultures brought a great dimension to our work. And although we often collaborated virtually because Ron loved being in Tennessee and who wouldn't. It never felt that way. It felt in that metaphysical Ron way we've heard so much about that he was in the next room and he was ready and with the precisely right advice and the precisely right information or the helping hand or the boost or steer that you needed at the precise moment. Ron, as you've heard from so many people today, was a loving and wise mentor, a hugely generous friend, and a colleague who improved the world for everybody he touched. His sudden absence hurts still, but as you've heard, the pain is buffered by the sense so many of us have who had the great fortune of having him in our lives, that somewhere he's still looking out for us. He was and will forever be the best kind of human being and a continued and cherished presence in, in all of our lives. I, I would like now to, to ask Ron's family to say a few words, and I understand that, uh, that Debbie and Mike might want to say a few separate words, and Debbie, if you would like to, is the, the, the senior partner, if you would like to start, or whatever way you want to do it. Well, I'm actually the senior. Yeah, so the senior partner, this, this is, given the culture Ron loves so much, I have a solid one. We would like to thank all of you for gathering here this afternoon to honor and celebrate Ron, Jane and Amy and Paul and Laura in particular. Thank you so much for making this such a wonderful event. Our family appreciates your phone calls and your letters, the condolence and remembrance, the emails 
and all of you, his foreign service family. You were his brothers and sisters for the many years that he was away from the lessons in the sick family. Ron rarely spoke of any of the hardships and dangers that you faced in the service to your country. He mostly spoke of good friends, both in the foreign service in your friends and host countries, and the interesting experiences you all had along the way. He cherished your friendships, and he was always so pleased when he heard that you were retiring, when he heard from you when you retired. He was especially happy when you came to his home in Redwood. He loved taking you to battlegrounds and country music venues and art galleries and his favorite little hole in the wall, strip mall, restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably looking down on us from heaven right now, listening to us all and singing with Eva. I can see him now, widening his eyes, looking up through his glasses. <laughs> this is what we in the family call the I will control your mind look. <laughs> Maybe that look is just an offshoot of that had cold eyes and a warm heart. Ron's warm heart would be very pleased having you here because he always loved a good party. Um, we just recently learned that Ron had a big secret from Cyprus, though, that in 2006 or somewhere along that time that he acquired the Mrs. Slipper. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea. That he had another sister-in-law. Or that being me is legal in Cyprus. <laughs> Jane, we're delighted that you joined our family. <laughs> And uh, by the way, it's your turn to host Thanksgiving. <laughs> There'll be 19 of us. <laughs> Brother pulled out his cell phone most days and showed me pictures that you posted on Facebook of your adventures and your babies and your grandbabies and your little furry friends. <laughs> you were his family. Now we feel like you're our family too. Many thanks to all of you. As Debbie has just said. It's an honor to get to meet with many of Ron's adored Foreign Service family members here today. Our mom couldn't be here today, but wanted me to make sure to thank each of you so much for being here and showering us with comfort and love on this solemn occasion. I'd like to take a few brief moments and thank you all for enriching Ron's life. Ron was happy. He loved his family, he loved his friends, and he loved his work. He was full of happy all the time, in large part due to you, his amazing brothers and sisters and his work family. Each of you meant so much to him. Each of you were part of God's reward to him. In the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon wrote, there's no greater gift in life than to enjoy the work God has given you to do and the family that he blesses you with in this lifetime. Our brother Ryan was truly blessed with these gifts. Solomon also wrote, we should remember our Creator in the days of our youth. At the tender age of six, Ron gave his heart to Jesus and was baptized with our sister Debbie in a little country church in Kingston, Tennessee. I think he made this choice because Mom and our beloved Granny Slicker instilled in each of us the love for God and the Bible. 
Ron carried this love with him all his earthly life. He realized at an early age the gift Jesus had given him, and even at six, he was able to understand a great deal when he saw it. A month or so ago, to the shock of each of us, Ron took his last breath on this side of eternity and left us without warning. On this side of heaven, we'll never know why he departed so soon. But God has promised us that there's a time coming when death will lose its sting. And that for those of us who belong to him, to be absent, absent from the, this body is to be present with the Lord. This is our promise. This is his gift to us. This is our comfort today. And this is why I know exactly where Ron is now. I guess I have a little Irish in me because I believe when a good man dies, we should celebrate his homecoming like we're doing today. There's a family reunion in our future, friends. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if Ron's already up there helping the good Lord to organize it with a twinkle in his eye and a big smile on his handsome face. After all, as Debbie just said, we all know Ron loved a good party. Finally, when I think of my big brother, I'm reminded of a verse in the fifth chapter of Matthew where Jesus told his followers, Blessed are the peacemakers who will be called children of God. Ron and so many of you here today are children of God. Thank you again so much for your friendship for your kind words and your service to our wonderful country. If we don't get a chance to meet again on this side of heaven, may God be with you all until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you all so very much for our sincere loving words and for hearing from beautiful thoughts from your family. Thank you. Before I ask another dear friend of Ron, Amy Dom, to close this and, and we have some time for some refreshments, um, I just want to say uh, a special word of thanks to particularly Jane Zimmerman and Laura Friedman for their extraordinary efforts in organizing today's event and for a very special anonymous donor who has supported it as well. All of you have shown love for Ron in a long way and, and in an actual way, so thank you. So now I'd like to introduce Amy Dawn to offer some closing thoughts and then we will have coffee and refreshments outside and we can do what, what Ron loves so much, which was kibitz and, and share share some thoughts and feelings. Debbie and Arthur, Mike and Darlene, colleagues, family, and friends. My heart aches at the loss of my dearest friend and mentor, Ambassador Ronald Schlicker. Uncle Ron, as he was known both inside and outside of the department, was always kind, compassionate, and understanding to all and taught me the importance of exercising cold eyes and a warm heart in both diplomacy and real life. He was brilliant, tempered with compassion. I wrote his speeches, organized his trips, and accompanied him on visits with Cypriot officials. We also smoked hookah, visited haunted historical sites, toured art galleries and antique shops, and spent many hours in Cyprus, Washington, D.C., and Tennessee talking about politics and life. We'd often text each other while watching the latest episodes of one of our favorite shows, Dead Files. <laughs> he was a kind and generous advisor and steadfast friend. When I think of Ron, I think of his kindness, his integrity and courage, his generosity of spirit, 
and his surprisingly wicked wit. And I also think of his paintings, a lot of them. Ron loved his paintings. He spent countless hours browsing art galleries and befriending and supporting artists. Ron had a great eye for art and color and over the years built up a beautiful collection. He ran out of room on his walls. One of our mutual friends said he advised her that paintings were like rugs. You should rotate them. <laughs> paintings were his one weakness and vice. He supported a variety of different art programs and photography openings and budding artists, both domestically and overseas. Our friendship began when, as a first tour officer at U.S. Embassy Nicosia, I arrived at Ron's office for my courtesy call. Ron was the ambassador to Cyprus at the time. This was my first ever courtesy call, and I was nervous. My colleagues had warned me that I would probably be in there for five minutes, tops. Well, 40 minutes later, Ron and I were talking about Savannah and haunted places and living in the South when it dawned on me that he was probably a pretty unusual ambassador and an extraordinary human being. It speaks to his skill as a consummate diplomat that he was so well liked and respected and could always find a common way forward. Ron loved people. He focused on meeting people one-on-one -on -one and understanding what they were going through on a person-to-person -person level. It's funny what you can learn about someone even after their death. Two of Ron's hallmarks were, as Tom noted, his integrity and his courage, both moral and physical. He put on body armor and faced live fire in Iraq in an act that was one of the bravest the envoy had witnessed. In addition to his physical courage, he had moral courage too, and he paid a price for it. Ron chose roles, made decisions, and led according to his values. In these tumultuous times, he is a beacon for other foreign service officers and public servants to follow as some struggle to serve. Ron was truly a leader of the people, including poor, disadvantaged, and people without a voice. He supported anti-trafficking efforts and worked with me to change trafficking laws in Cyprus and help traffic women. He visited a Cypriot jail to show kindness to inmates, which was singular in that many officials would consider that beneath their station and would not consider it part of their work. He loved kids, both his own nieces and nephews, very much so, but also other kids as well. We visited orphans at the SOS village and primary schools. He sought out orphanages to understand the life of children there. He visited the jails, visited orphans, supported artists, and threw the weight of the embassy behind helping and supporting trafficking victims. Ron also demonstrated incredible generosity of spirit in his mentorship of over a generation of foreign service officers. He was one of the best Arabic speakers in the department and universally respected. He rose to the highest levels of the State Department and paved the way for many others after. He had the trust of presidents, kings, and holy men. Ron had a nose for talent, and he sought out the best talent for his own A-team. He mentored women and men, and his protégés included African-American, Hispanic, Asian, and white officers from a variety of backgrounds. I know people who literally changed the course of their Foreign Service careers because he inspired them to learn Arabic and become experts on the Middle East. Ron was also steadfast. When I underwent a serious illness, and many of my other friends stated in the background, Ron kept making an effort to text, to drive up to DC, and call and see me. 
Whenever Ron visited Washington, we'd head over to Carbouche for dinner and a smoke with other good friends, including some of whom are here today. He often knew what I would say or what I was thinking, not a surprise for those who knew him. And no closing remarks would be complete without mentioning Ron's sharp wit. He was brilliant and had a wickedly funny sense of humor, which he often exercised on the tennis court. But he was never cruel, never mean. Whenever something would strike him as funny, he would glance over, he would look over his glasses and purse his lips, his eyes dancing merrily. His Yasser Arafat impression, which was alluded to earlier, finger wagging, was unparalleled throughout the department. So if you want to honor Ron, go for a drive, crank up his favorite singer, Eva Cassidy, and remember this benediction from Reverend Elizabeth Keeler of Christ Church, Georgetown, as you do, for I think it sums up Ron's attitude about life. Friends, life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. We hope you'll join us for dinner and a smoke, Ron's favorite pastime, just as Ron would have liked at Tarbouche later this afternoon. There will be a reception following. And thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. Thank you.